what this is my question for you, going back to that crappy bar and people pitching you, is is there, do you, like with Clubhouse, do you see competitors, do, do you think it's possible that another perhaps more decentralized or another kind of social media will emerge that will take on Twitter and Facebook and might be able to replace them? If you look at the whole landscape, yeah. Uh, with Clubhouse and everything else, do you think some other company might emerge? There'll be 10 versions of Clubhouse. We looked at social networking. We thought Friendster was it. Like Friendster was so good. Nobody would be able to compete with that. It was growing so quickly. And then MySpace was a juggernaut and they hit a hundred million in revenue and a hundred million users. And it was like, well, that's game over. And then Facebook and LinkedIn and Snapchat and FriendFeed and countless others, you know. So there's usually 20 people who will win in a category. Mm-hmm. Uh, and 80% of the category will be owned by the top two or three players. Um, but will those players change, do you think? What's your sense? Oh, of yeah, for sure. I mean, if we if Facebook hadn't bought Instagram, it would be a company in decline right now. People would be shorting the stock, right? Facebook peaked and then was sort of heading down. Um, and Instagram saved them and WhatsApp saved them. So, you know, that's another kind of weird moment in history that they were able to accumulate that much power uh, and consolidate that much power. Instagram should have never sold to them. That should have gone public. They had just raised money from Sequoia. And they had raised $50 million at a $500 million valuation, and they didn't need to sell. And that was a big mistake to sell. Uh, they should have kept going, and they should have take, took on Facebook. And if Instagram was a standalone company right now, it'd be worth $500 million. Do you think- $500 uh, billion. yeah. Do you think uh, Facebook might buy Clubhouse has been- uh... Uh, They'll probably copy it. I mean, Zuckerberg has no- moral compass or ethics or anything. I mean, he's a marauder. I mean, he basically <laughs> copied Snapchat seven times. Yeah, Like he did poke and he just kept trying and trying and trying. And it's part of the reason why the WhatsApp founders and the Instagram founders left is they found Zuckerberg so distasteful in terms of his ability to copy. What, like, do, you, what do you think makes uh, a great leader in that sense? Because, okay, so when I look at Zuckerberg- He's uh, a great executor. Is he a great executive? But I, I don't I, think he's a great leader. I was bullish on, I was excited by Facebook in the very early days. Sure. Uh, I thought it was an exciting opportunity to connect people and stuff started going wrong in certain yeah. kinds of ways. And again, maybe it's our human nature, but I attribute a lot of that to the leadership. Absolutely. And I mean, the guy started it because he was unable to ask girls if they were single and on a date. I mean, that was his that explicit- That could be a good motivator. That could be a good Well, motivator. I mean, it does, I mean, listen, right. the motivation of 18, 19 year old men yeah. is, yeah. yeah, pretty clear. Um, he was just trying, to, he had no game. He yeah. had no game yeah. and he needed to know who was single so he could, you know, at least have a shot at getting a, a date. a little creepy, a little creepy, yeah. You know, he, he, I think, was so obsessed with engagement and winning and he's he's kind of like one of those friends you have who's just really good at playing a video game, but maybe doesn't see the bigger picture in life. And um, I mean, there's a reason why everybody who worked for him hates him and doesn't talk to him anymore and then actively derides him. Like so many, this, the people who sold WhatsApp to him then backed other projects like Telegram and said horrible things about him on the way out. And these are the people he made billionaires yeah. um, and, and they really don't like him. Uh, so I think there is something that he does that does not breed loyalty. Uh, but he's very successful in his focus, which is growth is all that matters. He's a marauder. And taking friction out of products and processes is the playbook of Silicon Valley for the last decade or two. So whatever the That's friction poetry, is- poetry, what you're saying right now. Yeah. So you're speaking so fast that yeah. I almost forget that you're you're dropping bombs. But so removing the, friction. the uh, removing friction, and you're saying Facebook is exceptionally good at He was the friction. best at it. I mean, at Uber, they were like, we're going to take out tipping. We're going to take out the need for you to take out your credit card and do payment. It's just going to be in your wallet. You got picked up, you leave, that's it. And I was like, we should have tipping. And they're like, it adds a step. And we're trying to have no steps. You put your address in, you click the button, and you do nothing else. And so we've been obsessed here in Silicon Valley is how many clicks can we take out of the process? I guess Amazon is incredible at that as well. Absolutely. One click was the start of it. And then you look at Clubhouse as an example. You open Clubhouse and you see rooms, you click on it, you're listening. So in one click, you're listening. And then in one click, if you raise your hand, you get invited and you say, yes, you're speaking. So it's two clicks to speak, one click to listen. Yeah. I mean, the only way they could make that app work even faster is if you opened it up and your microphone was turned on and you, which is <laughs> yeah, that's, kind of scary, but that is the next evolution. And what happens when you go that fast is you get unintended consequences. Yes. And so what, this is why Facebook has had more fines than any company in the history of Silicon Valley, just giant fines for doing stuff like this. And one of them was, I don't know if you remember when they created groups or if you have a group for your podcast, 
But you know, you can just add people to a group without their permission. And there was this famous case when they first came out with it, um, somebody created a NAMBLA fake group, National Man Love Boy Association yeah. or whatever, like yeah. Pedophilia Association. <laughs> yeah. And they added Zuckerberg, Mike Arrington, myself, and like 20 other famous people in Silicon Valley. And I was like, and then somebody uh, takes a screenshot of it and they're like, you're yep. in NAMBLA? And I'm like, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Facebook allowed you, and then Zuckerberg's response was, "Well, if your friends put you in that Namla group, you should get new friends." And it was like, "You got put in there too." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then the sad part about it was, there were a group of young men who were gay and who were in college, and there was a gay choir in their college, and the person who was coordinating their Facebook group added them. Yeah. So Zuckerberg, it wasn't enough for Zuckerberg to make it so anybody could add anybody to any group because it will grow faster. Let alone you have to confirm you want to be added to the group. What it also did was posted it on their walls to increase engagement. And what yeah. they inadvertently did was they outed a bunch of 18, 19 year olds in college to their families because they joined the gay men's choir at some college. And this is the kind of way, you know, this is where Silicon Valley needs to check itself and, and to yes. do better is you have to really think. Well, there is my incentive to grow faster, and then there's what's right for society and for the individual. You got to think it through. Think it through. It's sometimes very difficult. This is where vision is required to sure. anticipate the uh, unintended consequences. And for it, sure. se it seems like Mark Zuckerberg is not uh, very good at that.